great to be here at NAB 2017. And uh, wow, 2017 already, can you believe that? Um, I am here this morning, I'm James Nyehouse, ASC. Um, and I'm here, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the new Canon C700. Um, I've been using this uh, camera, it's just out, um, on a project I'm doing called Bifrost. But just a little bit of my history. Um, some of you may have seen a film I did last year called A Beautiful Planet. Uh, it was director of photography on it. It was an IMAX production. We flew the uh, Canon C500 and the Canon 1DC system in space with the astronauts uh, for 15 months. And during that time, they shot 11 and a half terabytes of material, which was all beamed back to Earth uh, over NASA's wonderful broadband system they have. And um, we made the film. It's a 46 minute IMAX production uh, that's been in theaters now for a year. And um, what we did is I trained, I didn't get to fly in space, sadly, uh, but uh, I trained the astronauts. Uh, you can see Terry, uh, Terry Vertz and Samantha Cristoforetti up there working with the C500 and the Codex recorder, uh, which is what we used for our live action footage. Uh, we also uh, used a Canon 1DC uh, in still mode, shooting four frames per second, and they up converted that to 24 frames per second uh, for the final project. And that's Scott Kelly. He spent a year in space. Uh, you may have heard of him. And uh, so I trained the astronauts and they got to fly. And of course I didn't, sadly. Um, they got to have the fun in space. We shot from uh, the cupola. There's Terry with the camera in, um, in the cupola, which is a big great window looking back on the Earth uh, from the space station. And uh, in the past, the basic IMAX camera we flew in space was big enough, it, it took two hands to hold. Well, here you can see Chell Lindgren uh, holding two cameras in two hands. So we've downsized a lot in space these days. Um, so again, that's, uh, that's what I did, and that's what sort of got me going on Canon cameras for uh, digital capture. So when the C700 came out, um, I thought, well, that's, that's a really cool camera to use. And I'm working on this project called Bifrost into the Aurora. Um, a little bit about the film, it's we're in production, so f unfortunately I don't have any material that I can show you uh, today because we are in production and they're very strict about those things. But what this is, is a multi-platform release, uh, streaming documentary, uh, maybe a Netflix, we haven't got a distributor for it yet. Uh, but ultimately it will be also a giant screen IMAX film. So we're shooting for both the small screen and the big screen at the same time. And that's one of the things that really attracted me to the C700. Um, so yeah, what we're doing is exploring and image mapping the Earth's aurora. So what does that entail? Well, part of it entails putting a camera in a sounding rocket and launching it into the Aurora to film. Uh, so that's the main goal of the project. But other things that we're shooting is the preparation, the science behind all this study that's going on with the Earth's magnetosphere. So it's, it's a really cool documentary. It's a really interesting thing. It's not ever been done before. So we're breaking new ground, flying a, a, uh, a visual uh, recording system into the Aurora. Uh, Aurora Borealis, most likely the Northern Lights. There is a Southern Lights called the Aurora Australis, in case you didn't know. Uh, it's, a, it's a project put on by three guys, Heinz, Eric, and Sam. Uh, I think they were just sitting around in a bar in Norway one night, kind of smashed and said, oh, let's fly a camera into the Aurora. And that's kind of how I got started. They, uh, they, first off, they put it on a balloon, a weather balloon, and, and launched it, and then chased it all over Iceland after it landed, and um, figured out, well, that wasn't high enough, so now we've got to get into rockets. So they, they sort of built their own little rocket, and it kind of didn't do too well. Uh, so now they're actually, we're actually working with scientists and uh, people with NASA and um, doing, doing real rockets. So like I said, it's a... Um, it's a multi-part documentary. 
It is uh, for cross-platform delivery from everything from an iPhone up to the IMAX screen. I call it from squip, squint vision to IMAX. So uh, that's what we're doing with that. And we're working with various scientists, got some real people that actually know what they're doing when it comes to ro uh, launching rockets, and um, some, some universities who are studying the aurora. Um, so we, we're looking and been testing cameras to put into the, the rocket. And one of the ones we really looked into is the, is the new Canon ME20, which I don't know if you know that camera. It is a the high ISO. It goes up to 4.5 million ISO. Uh, and we shot with it this February in um, Alaska with the Aurora and some test launches that we photographed. So that's what we're looking at for, for launch. Uh, so, the C700. One of the things I really like about that camera is the multiple resolutions and recording options. You can record 4.5K uncompressed RAW to a codex recorder. You can rec record, uh, I think I have these listed so I don't have to remember them. Uh, 4K 12-bit uncompressed to the codex. Uh, 4K 10-bit compressed in either ProRes or AF-AVC on board to a CFAST card. You can record 2K 12-bit to that same CFAST card in the same codex. You can do an, an XF-AVC proxy 1080 at the same time. This is what really caught my attention and because it's something we had done on Space Station as well. We recorded proxies in the C500, as well as, four, or as well as the 4K onto a codex drive. The, the proxies were then downlinked uh, via the telemetry system, and then the drives were flown back aboard SpaceX uh, Dragon. So we were able to see what the astronauts were shooting without them having to go through the trouble of making a proxy. It was already done for them. So to find out that this camera is doing the same thing it's, it's such a time saver for production. I mean, you can record your proxies at the same time you're shooting your material. Now you don't have to spend all that time prior to editing uh, making proxies. I mean, that's, that's gonna save the cost of the camera rental right there, right off the bat. So I uh, was really happy with that feature. Uh, the camera does 120 frames in 4K RAW to the codex. That's really cool, especially if you're shooting rockets, because these rockets tend to haul ass when they're launching. I mean, they're there in one second, and they're gone the next. So you want to shoot them in high speed when you're, you're uh, documenting those things. So that was a big plus for me. Not something that we're going to use particularly, but it has anamorphic capability. Uh, so that's, that's a real plus for the, for the feature film produ productions out there. Uh, being able to shoot anamorphic with, with the camera. It's lightweight. This is cool because you don't want to launch a lot of weight into space. Um, the lighter weight, the better. Matter of fact, the first time I picked this up, I expected it to be maybe as heavy as an Aerie Alexa, and I nearly threw it over my head because it was so light. Uh, really surprising how light the camera is, but it's very robust. Um, I'll talk about some of, the <laughs> some of the bad things we put it through in Alaska. Uh, it has internal ACES support, so Academy Color Encoding System already built into the camera, so you've got the industry standard for, for, color, for color grading and, and inter, uh, 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 color, I'm, I'm, I'm lost for words here. <laughs> anyway, when you transfer your, your, your media across platforms and across uh, uh, companies for grading and for special effects for CGI, you're now staying in the same color space. Everybody's working from the same palette and also archiving. Uh, it does have a uh, SD2084 output option for HDR support with compatible monitors. So that's with the HDR things that are coming now, that's a real plus uh, to be able to see what you're capturing or to get a simulation of what you're capturing on set uh, while you're shooting. So there's the camera. Uh, the codex uh, plugs onto the back. It's an option. Um, 
And it actually, it, it, I found hand holding the camera that with the codex on the back, it actually helps the camera balance a little bit better on your shoulder. It, it, it tends to add a little bit of weight in the back. So um, that's, that's a really fun thing to put on. Uh, it just four bolts and it snaps on and you're off and running shooting 4K raw. Uh, it has a right side control panel. It's very similar to what an Alexa control panel looks like. Uh, if you're familiar with Alexa and if you're familiar with a Canon menu, you'll feel right at home with this control panel and this camera. It's pretty, pretty well thought out of. It also has a nice long extension so you can get away from the rocket when it launches. Uh, so that's sort of the post flow. Everybody's familiar with the CIE uh, uh, color gamut. Uh, but uh, the ACES is, is definitely covers all the color gamuts possible. Uh, it has three log options, uh, log, Canon Log, Canon Log 2, and Canon Log 3. Um, basically, your basic standard workflow for uh, uh, 4K recording. Uh, the internal ND filters is great. Uh, they have it designed in two separate wheels so that you can get a very broad range all the way up to uh, from two to, to ten stops of ND built into the camera. Uh, very helpful uh, uh, bright daylight and then but which wasn't really an issue that we had in Alaska it was the other end of the spectrum because we were all shooting at night. Uh, but that's a very nice function of this camera. This is, this is one of the rigs that we, uh, we set up. Uh, the C700 on bottom, the ME20 on top. Uh, the codex is on the back of the camera there, where it belongs. Uh, the ME20, we were running to an Atmos recorder, uh, recording 1080. We were shooting mostly with that camera at about 211,000 ISO uh, for the, uh, uh, the Aurora. Uh, one of the problems we were running into, and I, was, I think I've got an example of it here, um, when you launch a rocket, it's kind of bright. And when you're launching a rocket into Aurora, you've got a big dynamic range there. So one of the problems we're running into is getting both ends of that dynamic range for this launch. So one of the things we were working on was some way to record both the launch in one camera and the Aurora portion of the other, and then... Um, overlay the two and um, create a, a pseudo HDR image. Um, still very experimental. That, that seems to be my career, experimental stuff. IMAX, space, all this stuff. It's way too much fun. So in, uh, we were at the uh, Poker Flat Research Range. It's about 60 miles um, south of the Arctic Circle. Um, and it was a little chilly. I think our uh, low temperature, we hit about uh, a minus 35, I think. Uh, as I mentioned, we're, all of our locations were exterior nights. Uh, the Aurora, of course, you can only see it at night, so you have to be out at night. Um, so one of the first things we did is we set all the cameras up for an afternoon and let them cold soak and then see where things failed. Uh, those of you who ever think about going to shoot in cold spaces or if you've been and shot in cold places, uh, you know that there's, there's things that happen. The LCDs become very slow to respond. Uh, the batteries tend to go downhill really quickly. Uh, in fact, when, in, in times when I've shot in cold before, we would take the batteries, put hand warmers around them, and then stick them in, a, in, a, in an ice chest in a cooler to keep them warm and then run the cable out to the camera. Uh, in this case, when we were shooting Aurora, we had AC power, so we just ran AC power to the cameras rather than mess with batteries for that. Uh, one of the things that we found, which is, is something to, to consider, is the cables freeze, and all of a sudden, a power cable becomes a yardstick. And our, yeah, I'm sure you've seen the, the gag with the, uh, the invisible walking the dog on the leash. Well, that's what the power cables look like. They were stiff. I think we lost only about two or three cables from breakage during this time. So it wasn't too bad. We were prepared for much worse than that. Uh, and then we had to deal with snow when it warmed up. Uh, 
it's funny, it won't snow if it's below like 20 degrees, negative 20 degrees. So uh, uh, most of the time we were, we were in a minus 20 to minus 35 and then minus 55 with wind chilled involved. So you want to bundle up. Uh, you'll notice I don't have a glove on my, my right hand. I'd just been fiddling with the camera and a shot came up. And by the time I was done with a shot, I couldn't let go of the grip on the, on the camera. So uh, uh, gloves are a must. Uh, one other thing I would caution you about, and hopefully Canon, I don't know how much call they'll have for this, but the eyepiece on the C700 at minus 20 becomes rock solid. So you got to be careful you don't put your, put your eye out when you shove the camera to your face. Yeah, and there's a minus 35 with a 55, minus 55 wind chill. It was a little nippy, a little nippy. Uh, <laughs> you remember when you were a kid and you go out in the snow, your mom used to you know, dress you up. It'd take 20 minutes to get dressed up. Well, that's, that's the way it was every morning, every evening for, uh, for going out to work. Was, it took 20 minutes just to get dressed. Uh, we used a couple other cameras. We used an area, elect, or area mirror uh, as part of our test. Uh, and again, I'm shooting some of the behind the scenes documentary for, uh, for the, uh, the series portion of the, of the, the presentation. Um, we had a very small crew. That I think there was uh, six of us all told uh, for three weeks. The funny thing is, when you're shooting Aurora and rockets, there's a couple of things that have to happen. I mean, you, these scientists are launching the rockets with these payloads that they've been working on for years, and they've got observers downrange from where the launch site is. So the weather has to be good at the launch site, the weather has to be good at a couple of downrange sites, and then you have to have Aurora that's worth launching into, and then the wind has to be below a certain minimum. So you just don't go up there and okay light the fuse and go into the aurora you got to wait for all these conditions to work uh, we had a, a window of four weeks we were three weeks with for for three launch four launches so uh, again it's it's the standard motion picture movie uh idiom hurry up and wait and we waited and waited but we got a lot of nice aurora shots um, uh, another shot of the of the me20 with the uh C700. Yeah, I said it was light. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know whether the guy just caught me just throwing it up on my shoulder or whether I was actually holding it out and shooting like that. I don't remember. Uh, but a friend of mine, Terry Verts, who's an astronaut, I, I put this on my uh, Twitter feed and he, he messages me on Twitter and says, it looks like you're in the space, except for the snow, except for the mountains. <laughs> Thanks, Terry. Um, anyway, that's... Uh, it's kind of a nice lightweight system. I like it. Uh, here are the rockets. Uh, you can kind of see a guy over on the, the, the image on the left kneeling down taking a photo of it. That's at the uh, Geophysical Institute in Fairbanks. They have a display rocket. And then the image on the right is a launch from Wallops Island that we photographed last August. Um, like I said, these things, they're there one second and they ignite and they're gone. I was shooting the still images at 14 frames a second, and I got three images of it launching uh, before it was gone. So it, it's it's a it's a quick little rabbit. Um, so that's the rocket. Uh, they're called Black Black Brant Nines, in case you're interested. Uh, and this is kind of the sort of stuff we were shooting. Uh, this is the night that we launched three rockets in one night. Uh, if you're around and interested. Uh, this afternoon at the Canon booth, I've got some of the footage from the ME20 available that I'll be showing then of the two, the two launches into this particular Aurora this night. Of course, you're in the cold and haven't got it waiting, you've got to get the selfie with the Aurora in the background. Uh, so it's not as easy as it sounds. It, balancing the lighting and the Aurora and all that. Uh, and I still am as ugly as I'll get out. I caught this beard up there in Alaska and haven't been able to get rid of it. <laughs> it just was something for icicles to hang off of. Um, another part, like I said, is the behind the scenes of this whole process of launching the rockets, working with the, um, the investigators, the principal investigators that are, that are launching the payloads. Um, 
we are working with the University of Puerto Rico is one of the universities we're working with. And while we were there, a group of the students came from Puerto Rico to Fairbanks, Alaska to see what was going on, which was a real treat for us to watch them see the cold weather coming straight from Puerto Rico. Um, so we would uh, follow them around documenting what they were doing, their interactions with the, uh, uh, with the scientists. And it was a typical hurry up and wait and then panic like crazy. You know, the scientists don't want to be interrupted and then all of a sudden, okay, we've got a minute, bring the students in, okay, get in there, let's film. We're going to put 16 people in a little four by eight room and we want you to cover it. Okay, well, that's not a big deal. The C700 worked great with that. Uh, lightweight, you know, 40, 45 minutes, continuous shooting, handheld. You know, I was ready to go for more, which is good, because then we took all those people and stuffed them into a smaller room. And the only change I had to make was I went from a 24 to a 14 mil lens and just kept shooting. Uh, the room was a little bit darker. Um, the 14 mil was a little bit slower lens, so I had to bump the ISO up. I went up to about, I think it was about 2000 ISO, which was fine. The material looks just the same as it was at the native ISO, which is 800 on this camera. Um, so it's a very flexible, very user-friendly system. Uh, yeah, anyway. Uh, another shot of the Aurora. That's, you know, what do you do when you're uh, waiting in Fairbanks and there's some Aurora out there? You go out and shoot pictures of it, which is always fun to do. Uh, this is from one of the time lapses I was doing. Um, the video of this I'll be showing at the Canon booth, I think at 1.30. Um, what you see is the second of two rockets being launched. Uh, the main streak to the right uh, is rocket number two, and you can see the smoke trail from rocket number one to the left of it. And what they were doing was launching a payload that had uh, this trimethyl aluminum, I think that's a TMA, anyway, that's what it was, trimethyl aluminum. And it would release into the aurora and fall down and they were able to study the uh, solar winds uh, interaction with that and judge how the aurora was working. And uh, so one rocket would launch the, uh, the TMA and the other one would look at it from a different perspective, which is, was kind of cool because these launches happened within, I think, six minutes of each other, maybe even less than that. Uh, I know I kept rolling from launch one to launch two, and um, you can watch that happen. So it's a, it's a pretty amazing thing to see that. In the, uh, in the video, you actually see the second rocket go up through the smoke trail and illuminate the smoke trail of the first rocket. Uh, again, that was shot with the ME-20. And of course, when you're Alas in Alaska, you have to um, uh, you know, do as the locals do. So the, the local watering hole was uh, uh, Chetanika Inn. <laughs> I think if you watch uh, Ice Road Truckers, you'll be familiar with that place. Uh, it's really fun. <laughs> a bit of Alaska that you might not see. Um, was talking about Cannon Raw, and then I'm almost done here. This is a still image I shot of the very first um, sounding rocket that launched. And I looked at the image and I'm going, oh crap, that's totally unusable. I, I'm screwed, you know, what am I going to do? Well, that's what came out of that after photoshopping. I was totally blown away at how much, how much information was in that shot, even though I'd totally blown the exposure. So um, another case for shooting raw you can save your butt. Questions? I love questions. I don't have to make anything up then, or maybe I do. No questions? Boy, I must have done a good job. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Uh, if you want to follow me, I'm on uh, I'm 70 millimeter DP on Twitter and Instagram, and uh, text me, email me, or whatever, and uh, be happy to answer any questions you might come up with. And I would like to thank B&H very much for having me today here at uh, NAB. And uh, you guys rock. Thank you.